This morning it could be a marriage, it could be a business, it might be a once bright relationship and friendship that has become tarnished somehow. What I speak of this morning could speak to a church in decline or a government in gridlock or a diagnosis that carries the word terminal. I want to talk to you about hopelessness. And who among us has not grappled with hopelessness? That sense that it's not going to get better. Who among us has not felt challenged by a wave of discouragement? a wall of impossibility, a surge of futility. The Bible features a forensic scene sure to pique the interest of the most experienced forensic examiner. Long before Patricia Cornwell wrote her books or Kathy Wright came along and gave us the gnarly world of bones, long before Sherlock Holmes, before CSI, long before we knew that bones could really tell us anything. Bones were telling the story of love, of faithfulness, of redemption, of restoration, of hope. This morning's story is the story of bones from Ezekiel 37. Last week I talked to you about the Bible being one story, his story. History is his story. From Genesis to Revelation, I argued against a false division or bifurcation where we separate the two and we, we say we live over here in the New Testament age and every once in a while we look over there in the Old Testament. You cannot do that. You will develop, you will develop a faith that is only partly formed if you carve yourself away from Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Leviticus and Genesis you'll find that in the New Testament they're constantly referencing Jesus and the apostles as they write, constantly referencing the old. And so I take you to Ezekiel today, and the moment I say Ezekiel, for some of you, you say, that's the one I tried to do in the one-year Bible, and it wiped me out. I quit. I got to Ezekiel, and I stopped. I barely survived Leviticus. But when I got to Ezekiel, I was toast. I was done. I didn't know about the third horn and the left ear, and the, the wing coming out of the, and I couldn't figure it out, so I just quit. Well, I want to encourage you today. There is life for us here in the Old Testament. There's life in Ezekiel for us in a story of death. There's life in a graveyard. Ezekiel 37, verse 1. The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed they were very dry. And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O Lord God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy, where it, the word prophesy comes in Old Testament here, it's speak forth, prophesy. Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter you and you will live. The word for breath is the same in Hebrew for wind and for spirit. And as we'll see as we carry through in this study and also in the message next week, we're talking about the work, the work of the Holy Spirit. So I just take note of these verses because we'll be coming back in reference. Surely I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I'll put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you. you shall, uh, I'll cover you with skin and put breath in you, and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews of the flesh came upon them, and skin covered over them, and, but there was no breath in them. Also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they might live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came upon them, and they lived and stood to their feet, an exceeding great army. Then he said to me, here's the meaning for Ezekiel in his day. 
Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They indeed say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open up your graves and cause you to come out of your graves, and you will know. Uh, and, I'm sorry, and bring you to the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, that I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you from your graves. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. And may God add his rich blessing to his word. Ezekiel's prophetic vision came in a time, its historical context is devastating. The Jewish homeland is no more. The capital city has been utterly destroyed. The people have been dispersed. Most have been deported. There is no temple in Jerusalem. There are no walls around Jerusalem. There are no remaining forms of government or institution in Jerusalem. Jerusalem resembles a nuclear nightmare. Envision, if you will, what Greensboro would be like after some type of a devastating hit where the only people, and you've seen this depicted in a lot of fantasyful movies, you, just all you see is a few uh, people, just a few of the dregs who have somehow survived living in the rubble and possibly a few wild animals running around. But Greensboro, a wasteland, absolutely devastated. Imagine that. That's what Jerusalem was. Left in ruins after 586 B.C. It was destroyed. And anybody who lived in Jerusalem, you can be sure, was a societal bottom feeder. They were people who had absolutely nothing to give. They would have been those who were blind or lame or maimed or considered to be not worth anything to the Babylonians. They left those they considered to be the dregs. They left them in the city. City of beggars paupers. It would seem to any knowledgeable observer that the children of Israel had finally pushed God too far. And if the Old Testament teaches us anything, it's that you cannot trivialize God. You can't play fast and loose with the things of God. He is the God of grace. He is the God of mercy. He is the God of love. But he is also revealed in the scripture as a God of judgment. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. The beginning of wisdom and knowledge. A lot of people have this idea that because we're living under New Testament grace, now Jesus has become like our big lovable uncle, and God is a Santa Claus. And they close their eyes to the character of God revealed from Genesis to Revelation. By the way, in the New Testament, you find God still entering into his role as judge. And we within the church, the Bible says we're going to be judged first. And so we have to take to heart the warnings that we find in the Old and the New Testament. And the children of Israel did not. How long and how often God warned them. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet and they killed the prophets. And they ignored them. And they ended up reaping the whirlwind. They were effectively wiped off the map. They were most of them assured that they would be absorbed into, Babylon, into Babylon's melting pot. It looked as though the Jews as a nation would go the way of the Mayan or the Inca. They would simply disappear off of history's page. And indeed, the children of heaven, or the children of God, the children of Israel, exiled and enslaved some 700 miles from their homeland, felt that they had no hope felt that they were dead, worse than dead, felt that there was no future, felt that they would never know the breath of God, the Spirit of God, once again, felt that they would never rise up as a nation, felt that they would never be put together again. They felt all of these things. They were sure of all of these things because the devastation was so severe. And I'm speaking to people who feel the same way about your life, about your marriage, about your job, about your future, about your hopes. It'll never be. It can never be. We can't fix it. It's, it is what it is. You've convinced yourself. Some of you have resigned yourself to something less than a miraculous life. And into this darkness, God sends his prophet Ezekiel 
with an incredible vision where dry bones hold the key to God's great mystery. And in the study of Ezekiel's descriptive vision, there are five observations that I, I would offer you, and they're applicable to your life as surely as they are applicable to the children of Israel in Ezekiel some 500 years before Jesus walked the face of the earth. First of all, a valley of dry bones, the graveyard, it's a place that no one ever wants to go. You don't want to go there. This vision that Ezekiel received, you don't want to receive it. I can't imagine a place so hopeless, a reminder of such horrific slaughter, a bone pile of defeat. It's a horrible place. It's every global killing field. It's every mass grave that's uncovered. It's one stark and terrible vision. Most people are uncomfortable in a graveyard. I realize those people in the graveyard are in the graves and they're not alive and until the resurrection they're not going to be alive and I'm not afraid of no ghosts. But I don't like graveyards. It's not a place I like to hang out. I'm in graveyards from time to time, and I'm always rejoicing when we're taking some saint of God who has gone home to their eternal reward, and we're planting their body in the ground like seeds, saying in sure and so certain hope of a resurrection. I love that, but I don't come back every week to check on my plantings. Not too crazy about graveyards. You don't want to be there. You don't want to live there. How much more so a boneyard? It's a lifeless scene. Even the animals are done with it. There's no more nourishment. There's nothing more to be chewed. It's just white, dried, dusty bones. You walk into that boneyard and to your left may lie the bones of a young man who dreamed of marrying his sweetheart, but he never went home. He was killed in war and he was left out in that boneyard for his flesh to rot away and ultimately his uniform until there's nothing but bones. It's devastating. Next to him, you'd never know who it was because nothing remains, but next to him was the bright general, the general that they trusted and the general that they hoped in, the general who was going to lead them into battle, but it all came to nothing and now his bones are there among the anonymous and the unidentified who followed after his tragic commands and the bones have been scattered and what good are all of the achievements and all of the dreams now, everything dies in a boneyard. Everything dies there. It doesn't live there. It dies there. You've got the rich. You've got the poor side by side, intermingled, shattered dreams and destinies, a reminder of those who are missing in action. No mother, no mother could find her son or her daughter in a boneyard. It's just, it's spread out everywhere as far as the eyes can see. Who could know? It's a valley filled with hopelessness place you never want to go. But many people end up there. And a few even live there. They live with a sense of, well, it's a living death. No real grasp of destiny or purpose. It's somebody here this morning hating where and how you're living and what you're going through, feeling that your life is going nowhere. It's over before it even began. Dry bones. When I read Ezekiel chapter 37, I see a place that you would never want to go. Secondly, I see a possibility, a possibility you would never consider. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? Well, the answer is no. Isn't it a rhetorical question? Can these bones live? You say, well, I would have said, well, yes, Lord, they can live. Well, God bless you. My honest answer would have been, no. These bones can't live. And that's the point of the text. They've given up on the bones. Nobody expects any life to come out of the bones. The bones signal the end. And the children of Israel look at their whole existence and say, it's over. It's done. Close the chapter. God is through with us. He's mad at us. He's fed up with us. It's over for us, maybe for our children, but we can't even see how. We are the bone boneyard. We are done. It's over. The boneyard's not about birth. It's about bones. It's not about life. It's about death. It's not about hope. It's a vision of hell. 
Yet the question is asked, can these bones live? I can hear all of heaven asking the question. Any answers? Any answers out there? And so nature, nature cites the law of thermodynamics and says, well, all things we know that are, are in a state of decay. We know that all of the universe, the law of thermodynamics tells us that what's wound up is now winding down. Everything in the world is like that. It's not going from a disorganized state to a more integrated or organized state. It's in a form of falling apart and decay. That's simply the law of nature. And so nature rises up and says, well, nature votes no. Can these bones live? Science laughs out loud at the question because everybody knows, for pity's sake, everybody knows dead is dead. So science votes no. History joins the fray by stating, well, it's never happened before. So history votes no. Then the evolutionist says, well, I like the concept, but I'd need 50 million years to pull it off. So evolution votes no. And then the geneticist comes along and says, well, maybe someday, somehow, in theory, but not now, genetics votes no. So what does Ezekiel say? He opens a door of possibility where others have sealed it tight as a tomb. He says, oh, Lord, you know. In other words, with you, we're dealing with something completely outside the natural realm. You know. Hear me today, God's answer is yes. It doesn't matter if man's collective wisdom says no, God's answer is yes. When we've reached that state of utter hopelessness, he's not out of options. His hands are not tied. He hasn't finished the story. Until he calls you home, the story's still being told. You are immortal until his work is finished in you. You are not hopeless. You are not a dead end. Ezekiel believes in God, the giver, the creator of life. He believes with God all things are possible. He doesn't bow to the force of nature, nor to the scientist or geneticist or the evolutionist or the historian. He bows before the creator of the universe and says, I submit myself wholly to you. You alone know the answer to this question. Hear me today with God, the answer is yes. In Ezekiel's boneyard, we find a place... We would never go, a possibility we would never even consider. And with God, you'll find a, a plan that you could never even imagine. His ways are not our ways. Part of the reason that you're struggling, and I've struggled so often trying to make the plan work, is it's been my plan. My plans notoriously fail. I'm standing before you as a tried and true, well, this is quite a testimony, isn't it, this morning? Failure. When I try and work my plans, when it comes to the eternal purposes of God, I fail hands down over and over and over again. God's plans are always outside the box. He doesn't do things how you would expect, how you would think. God says, prophesy to these bones and say to them, I don't know about you, you don't talk to dead bodies. You don't talk to dry bones. And yet Ezekiel is told to do exactly that. How often in the New Testament do you find Jesus telling people to do irrational things? How often... Do they have to do something to demonstrate that they have faith? Something that seems to have no basis in fact whatsoever? The man with the withered, can you imagine how insulting it was to the man with the withered arm when Jesus said, stretch out your arm? And he goes, that's the problem. I can't. What Jesus asked the man with the withered limb to do was completely irrational. Peter, get out of the boat. 
It's not rational. If you want to see the hand of God, you have to be willing to do that which will not fall into your natural inclination. Prophesy to these bones. Talk to the bones? Yes, talk to the bones. Talk to the bones. And say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This, thus, the word of, thus the Lord says to these bones, Surely I will cause breath to enter into you. That's all about the Spirit. Next week we're going to talk about that. I'll cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. I'll put sinews on you, bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin, put my breath in you. You shall live, and you will know that I'm the Lord. Ezekiel says, So I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, sinews and flesh came upon them, skin covered them over, but there was not yet breath in them. Ezekiel, I want you to speak to dry bones. And when you say what I want you to say, and when you speak my word, my words over these bones, my words with their life-giving force are going to change things in a way that you never could have imagined. Are you praying God's word over your boneyards? Are you praying God's word over your family? Are you praying God's word over a rebellious child? Are you praying God's word over your poverty? Are you praying God's word over your desperate circumstances and situations? Are you praying God's word over shattered relationships? Or are you just whining about it? Are you praying God's word or are you complaining, even complaining to God? I got news from you. Oh, well, no, I, I can't do that. I'll go out on a limb. The Lord would just say to some of you, I don't want to hear that anymore. I don't want to hear that anymore. Stop whining. Stop complaining. Buckle up your boots and start speaking my word over your life circumstances and situations. You say, well, I'm not sure exactly what word I need to speak, Pastor. Here's my A, B, and C. What word do I need to speak? Uh, yeah, I need to understand. I'm not going to tell you. Because you're never going to learn how to rise up until you go find it. And it won't mean anything. If I share, it won't mean anything to you except you're turning the pages of your Bible and suddenly it's you, it's the Holy Spirit, it's the living Word of God, and it's that moment where suddenly, supernaturally, God speaks to your heart you need to figure out where it is in the Scripture that speaks to your circumstances and begin to speak the Word of God over your life circumstances, over your broken relationships, over your shattered dreams, over your hopes, dashed hopes, over your compound fractures. You need to speak the Word of God because as we prophesy the Word of God and we speak His truth, we set ourselves up for the invasion of the supernatural. I'm not talking about something metaphysical here. I can stand here and say, in Jesus' name, I'm a monkey, I'm a monkey, I'm a monkey, I'm a monkey, I'm a monkey. And according to my confession, I will not become a monkey. I might act, but I won't become one. People have to go, oh, be careful what comes out of your mouth, whatever comes out of your mouth. Oh, dear. We get so wrapped up in the semantics of it, and we miss the spirit completely. Speak truth. Speak the word of God. He's not a terrorist. He's not saying, let me see now if you're really full of faith enough. I'm watching you. Speak the Word of God with joy. Speak the Word of God with confidence. Begin to pray it even, even if at first you say, I, I don't even know if I can believe God to do this. So just keep praying that Word of, of God. It will get in you. It will begin to flow through you. The Spirit of God will come where the Word is spoken and suddenly there's a rattling taking place and the broken pieces of your life begin to come together and suddenly that which had lost its shape and form begins to take on shape and form and you have resurrection on your hand. But you have to speak. See, I mean, our thing is, when, whenever we see a job that needs to be done, we think in terms of hands. God thinks in terms of words. They were amazed when he stood up in the boat and he said to the storm, peace be still. And they said, who is this? That he can speak the word and the storms obey him. 
Most of us don't even think about really starting the process by just speaking God's word over our broken valleys, shattered places. No, because we want to sort it all out ourselves. Bottom line, that's what we humans do. We face a boneyard, what do we do? We clean it up. First thing you have to do, and I'm, first thing you got, you've got to sort the bones. You've got to get catalog the bones. I'm, I'm thinking boneyard. I'm thinking bones everywhere. I'm thinking about you got rib cages over here, and you got a head over here, and you got a femur over here, and you, and you got all kinds of other stuff and I, bones I can't even name all. And I don't even know how they all fit together. But I'm going to start sorting. I've got to start someplace. So what do we do? And that's what a lot of us do. All we do is we just continually sort through the bones and the broken pieces of our lives. There we are, we're sorting through Grandpa again. There we are, we're sorting, we're sorting through that failed relationship. There we are, sorting through the business again. And all we do is handle dead bones, dry bones. All we do is just sort the pieces out and try and put them in order. We try and get them in proper relationship with each other. We try and do God's work for Him. Don't we always want to clean up the offering before we bring it? Just as I am. That's how we're supposed to come. Just as I am without one plea. Cast all my cares on him. No, no, no. What we do as Christians is we try and clean everything up and say, Lord, I've got this pretty well in hand now and I'm just giving it to you. You bring him the mess. You bring him the dry mess. The stuff that doesn't fit together. The stuff that doesn't look like it's got any life. Well, it doesn't have any life. The dead stuff. You bring him all that stuff. So often we want to go research ways that we can attach the bones. There's no way anybody can put the bones together in a boneyard and raise up an army. They'll end up with a skeleton wired together. That's all they'll get. And within the body of Christ, so often that's what we have become. Somewhat of a skeleton wired together that looks maybe a little bit like the church should look like, but it doesn't live, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't function, it doesn't fly, it doesn't rise, it doesn't run. It just looks kind of like the form of because we've wired it all together. We need life. We need breath. We need the supernatural or we've got nothing. So we think we've got to get our hands involved and God says, speak my word. Speak my word. You see, God has plans that are beyond our wildest imagination. Ezekiel, when he first saw that boneyard, it wasn't in his wildest imagination that God was going to raise up an army out of the boneyard. Never even crossed his mind. You know, some of the best things God has ever done for me, in me, through me, were things that he did that had never really crossed my mind. He's a God of perpetual surprises, serendipities, undiscovered goodnesses along the way. A few days ago on Facebook, I was thinking about Oral Roberts, and so I posted, I posted his tagline, something good is going to happen to you. How many people absolutely do not believe that this morning? Something good is going to happen to you. You go, yeah, right. Well, it probably won't. There are a few here who honestly, how many of you do believe something good is going to happen to you? How many of you believe that there's something around the corner, that there's hope on the way, that there's help tomorrow? How many of you believe that there actually is something to celebrate out there? How many of you believe your life is not yet over and that he's still at work within you? How many of you believe that he hasn't yet withdrawn his spirit from this world and he's not going to abandon you because he promised? Hopeless? I look at these guys over here and within their age, within this age group, often there is rampant hopelessness. How many of you are like me, looking at this age group saying, how could anyone that young feel hopeless? Doesn't it cause you just to kind of scratch your head? Statistics don't lie. And it doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, that spirit of despair, that heaviness, that sense of futility, that discouragement, a sense that your life is over even before it's begun. This is all the work of the adversary. He robs us of hope 
and he loves to strip away hope in the supernatural. He loves to tell you, you got to quit looking to the skies as though some type of miracle is going to take place because miracles don't happen. I'm here to tell you miracles do happen. I'm here to tell you you can look to the sky. I'm telling you you can look up. I'm telling you the Word of God is authoritative and those people who are speaking those lies are not. I'm telling you there is hope. There is a better day just ahead for you if you'll put your faith in God. When God puts faith in our hearts to speak, our words become powerful in the realm of the Spirit. Words are powerful. We should. The Bible tells us to confess our sins. How many of you do all your confessing in your head? Speak them out. No, I couldn't do that. Well, go lock yourself in a shed someplace and speak them out. There's something about speaking those things out. If, if I'm studying, if I'm, if I'm reading a book and I'm studying, if I will read the book to myself, I retain about 30% more than just reading the book. There's something powerful about speaking. Speak the Word of God. There are times when I talk to myself. David talked to himself all the time. We've got it recorded right there in Scripture. It's okay to talk to yourself. David said, why so downcast, O my soul? Put your hope in God. What was that? That was a pep talk. Every once in a while he said, self, I got something I need to tell you. I've got a challenge I need to deliver, self. Yeah, I'm talking to you. Your crown doesn't impress me at all. You can get down off your high throne right now, David. I knew you when you were a shepherd boy. I was you when you were then. And so, self, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. I'm speaking to you. The you that cowers like a little boy in the dark, afraid. Talk to yourself. Speak the word of God. Suddenly, you won't feel like yourself anymore. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings as eagles they will walk and not grow weary they will run and not they'll run and not grow weary they'll walk and not faint god spoke the world into existence is anything too hard for him oh his power is awesome it's for it's a power it's a power this text reveals a power that we can never measure oh the power of god do we have any idea do we have any idea what kind of power we invoke when we gather together on a Sunday morning? Equations are written down and gauges are built to measure power. The power of electricity, the power of water over a dam, the power of the wind, the power of sunlight. We, te we, we speak in terms of kilowatts and, and joules and lumens and horsepower and miles per hour, feet per second. There is no measure that can keep up with, life, with God's life-giving power. It's a power greater than any addiction. It's greater than any disease. It's greater than any woundedness. It's greater than any hurt. It's greater than all of the assembled armies of the earth combined. It's a power that's greater than the splitting of the atom. It's greater than, than the accumulation of all of our passions. It's a power that's greater than physical death. It's greater than decay. It's greater than hell. It's greater than darkness. It's greater than a boneyard full of white, chalky, dry bones. God wants to speak his empowering word over the dry bones of your life. Do you dare believe in this power that cannot be measured in human terms? Eze I Ezekiel prophesied to the bones, and the bones took their proper place and were supernaturally clothed with flesh. Ezekiel prophesied to the breath, prophesied to the breath. That, bre that word breath, rock, in Hebrew is the same as wind and, and spirit. Breath, wind, and spirit carries all the same idea. Literally, when the Holy Spirit is working among us, literally, God is breathing on us. I grew up in a church, and we sang songs that dealt with a lot of that symbolism. And I, I can remember altar times as a kid growing up in my dad's church where a congregation would would stand there with their hands raised to heaven, singing out, let it breathe on me, let it breathe on me, let the breath of God now breathe on me. I remember as a kid not understanding why it was so moving for people, but they were just opening their hearts up saying, Holy Spirit, just come and, and breathe into my impossible life. 
your great power. It all takes us back to the Garden of Eden where God formed man out of the dust of the earth and having made this magnificent clay sculpture, he breathed life into that clay and man became a living soul. I thrill at that passage in Genesis for you see today my respiration My respiration is a response to his initial inspiration. He breathed out. We're still breathing today because of the breath of God making man a living soul. We're nothing but dust. We know that when the soul is gone, the body returns to dust. But he has put in us that living spirit. He has given us that gift of life. Life is sacred. I'm just an extension of the life that God gave in Adam. I live because of the first Adam, but I also live because of the second Adam. Paul says, so it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Jesus is that life-giving spirit. And he doesn't just give you life to save you from hell. He gives you life and power to overcome the adversary. And he gives you hope and a future. I'll make you an exceedingly great army. God didn't just promise them an existence. He promised them a glorious destiny. Finally, there's a promise in all of this that you must never forget. Bones are evidence of life that once was and is no more. Bones are the remnant of of death. Bones are are what we bury and what we hide. They're bleached white by the sun. They're evidence that something ghastly and ghoulish has happened, something catastrophic. They are just one step away from dust, which is the ultimate end of all flesh. But even in the face of death and bleached dry bones, God promises new life, miraculous restoration, supernatural intervention. He promises us. So listen to me today. You boneyard dwellers about to give up hear me as I speak a prophetic word into the catacombs of your heart it's not over and the final word has not been spoken and God has not yet breathed breath into that boneyard but he will prophesy call upon God prophesy to the winds a spirit of God Take over the dead places in my life. Bring about a resurrection in my life. Fill me with the Holy Ghost and power in my life. Come and transform me. Change my life. Make me a different creature. I'm tired of living death. God has called you to live a victorious Christian life. Speak over the boneyard. It's not over. It's a scene of resurrection. It's the reversal of a disastrous course. It's a life out of death story. Ezekiel prophesied of those dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. The history of the Jews demonstrates God's faithfulness to a faithless people. He's so long-suffering. And against all odds in Israel, Though they thought they would never be returned to the land, they would never see a temple again, they would never know temple worship, they would never see their city restored, they would never have walls around Jerusalem, they would never see Jerusalem again. All of those things had been wiped out for them. They were off the map, they were off the table. In spite of all of those things, a new king rose up in Babylon and he reversed the old policies of deportation returning the Jews to their homeland, first under Zerubbabel, and they built the temple in Ezra, and they instituted the law, and then Nehemiah, and he rebuilt the walls of the city. And every promise God made through Ezekiel that out of the boneyard, God would speak life into his people once again. Every promise has been fulfilled. Listen to me, friends. The fact that today there is a nation of Israel, there is a Jewish state on the face of the earth, Today, because God is yet working out the final phases of his plan for mankind and his chosen ones, Israel, all of this is testimony that what Ezekiel said, prophesied to these dry bones, all of it simply says you can trust God with the broken, dry, dead pieces of your life. He'll speak life there. The Jewish history is written and it's recorded. Your history is being written even as I speak. 
And what will it be? A boneyard? Or a resurrection? What will it be? More defeat? Or victory? An end? Or a brand new beginning? Son of man, can these bones live? Can these bones live? Your bone yards need God's word, not words of death, but words of life and words of faith. I'm speaking to people about your marriage. I'm talking about your purpose. I'm talking about shattered dreams. I'm talking about power beyond your wildest imagination. I'm talking about a calling that God has and a placement that he has for you in time. I'm talking about healing and restoration. I'm talking about those things that you have counted as impossible, and especially those things that you have considered to be a total lie. Don't you know who this God is that we serve? Don't you know? You say, my situation, my, my circumstances, my relations with my, with my son, it's so shattered, there's absolutely no way that we can put the pieces back together. The words have been spoken, the wounds have been, have been suffered. It's just never going to happen, Pastor. Stop speaking that way. You stop speaking that way. Somehow you, lost in your sins, have been reconciled to your Heavenly Father, and God can make a way where there is no way. I want to speak to those of you who are struggling in your households. You're struggling with your kids. You're struggling with your marriage. You're struggling trying to make it work. Don't you listen. Don't you listen to the stats. The stats will tell you. Just check out. Just start over. Just do your own thing. Look, the reward in life is found for those who endure, those who walk through the dark places. God will give you more than you ever knew. And there are people here who will testify, who have been to the brink, who have stood in the graveyard of their marriage and seen God do a resurrection work. Those of you who have let go of a dream, he'll give you a bigger dream. He'll do things with your life that you never could have imagined. You know what my big dream was? I was going to be a musician. That was going to be the scope of my life. I was going to play music. I was going to sit behind a set of drums for the rest of my life and, and just enjoy the joy that is music. That was going to be it for me. I had absolutely no idea at 17 years old on a Sunday morning walking in to do my bit and be a faithful preacher's kid sitting through a service that I didn't even listen to. I had no idea whatsoever that at the close of that service, God was going to suddenly ambush me and say, let me show you what kind of life. And I yet have yet, I have yet to uncover all that he wants to do in me and through me. I'm still discovering what he has in store for me. And he has the same for you. The same for you. But you have to trust him. You have to trust him. 